North Carolina pulled a Kansas and landed an ACC transfer to join their front court in mid-August. Is this new addition a sign of a different play style coming to Chapel Hill? You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, folks? Happy Thursday, and welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, the only daily national college hoop show out there, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, Andy Patton, joined today by our regular guest, Leaf Tulin. And folks, you are joining us at the place to get your college basketball content every single day, five days a week, 52 weeks out of the year. I want to give a special shout out to our everyday listeners and those of you hanging out with us in our Discord channel. If you have not joined it yet, it is free to do so. There's a link in the show notes on both audio and video platforms. Today's episode of Locked On College Basketball is brought to you by GameTime. Folks, download the GameTime app now, create an account, and use code Locked On College, and you will get $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Well, North Carolina landed themselves a new big man in the transfer portal. We're going to talk about that, what it might mean for Hubert Davis's team and play style this upcoming season. We're also going to discuss CBS's Candid Coaches survey. They've released the first two questions in that survey of over 100 Division I college basketball coaches talking about the best team in college basketball and the best player in college basketball. We're going to talk about whether we think those coaches got it right, who they might have left off in terms of teams and players who are going to be really good this upcoming season. But Leaf, I want to start with what is now the second kind of big time transfer portal movement in August. And for folks who, who've been tracking this stuff, uh, especially last off season, we had a ton of movement in August. It was a, an insane kind of first full year with the transfer portal cycle. And at that time, graduate transfers could enter the portal at any time. And, and we saw a ton of movement in the, the late July, August, even into September. Uh, we, we still saw rosters getting finalized players transferring and then retransferring graduate students entering the portal. It was it was chaos. And, and this year, it really was a lot tighter. The transfer window seems to really be effective. We saw the, the lack of grad transfers being able to enter after a certain date. Uh, teams really kind of prioritize cleaning up their roster sooner. However, in the case of David Coit, who went to Kansas, and we talked about that on an episode earlier this week, as well as the case here with Tijan Claude, these two players entered the transfer portal way back in April, and yet we're waiting on waivers from the NCAA. As we know, that takes a long time to get those waivers approved. Uh, Finally approved for Coit last week or two weeks ago, approved for Claude last week. Now these two guys can find themselves new landing spots, and they both end up at Blue Blood programs. A little bit about Claude. He spent last year at Georgia Tech, averaged about five points and five rebounds per year, made four starts, played 20 five-ish minutes per game. Uh, Wasn't a huge impactful player for Damon Stoudemire's team. Uh, He did have a great game against North Carolina on January 30th, had nine points, eight boards, and three blocks in Georgia Tech's upset win there. So probably helped, uh, you know, make himself a little bit more appealing to Hubert Davis and the Tar Heels, seeing him do that. Uh, He previously was at Moorhead State for three years, although he was injured for most of that. Uh, He was at Western Carolina, averaged 15 and a half points at eight and a half boards there. That was kind of what put him on the high major radar, landed him at Georgia Tech. He's a North Carolina native. Uh, And now he goes to North Carolina where they lose Armando Baycott. They lose Harrison Ingram. And they had a bunch of targets that they really wanted in the transfer portal this offseason. Heavily involved in trying to land Cliff Cliff Amuri from Rutgers. Heavily involved in trying to land Coleman Hawkins, JT Toppin from New Mexico. And they didn't make any of the big splashy moves that a lot of folks hoped or expected to see them make. Instead, they add Van Allen Lubin from Vanderbilt, who's fine, 12.6 boards in the SEC. It's not nothing, but Vanderbilt's not particularly good. And then they go out and they add uh, Claude here from Georgia Tech, who is, you know, less productive, but at a better school at Georgia Tech. But the thing that stands out to me, Leaf, and what I kind of want to talk about with this North Carolina conversation is less about Claude specifically, but more about this team added two six foot eight centers or six foot eight bigs. They have two returners in Jalen Withers and Jalen Washington. Washington's 6'10, Withers is 6'8. Ultimately, this is going to be a much smaller team than they were last year. And I expect 
without Baycott's just demanding presence in the front court, I kind of think this North Carolina team is going to play a little bit faster, maybe a little bit looser, less bogged down in the half court by kind of dumping the ball down on the block. Uh, that's my read just based on seeing these moves and kind of knowing the play styles of these guys. But uh, I kind of think it's a, a fun potential change that we might see, especially based on the guard personnel that the Tar Heels have coming into the season. Yeah, I think that last bit's super important because, yes, they they lost Armando Baycott, who set a bunch mm -hmm. of records, was a stalwart there for quite some time. But their backcourt brings back the ACC Player of the Year, first mm -hmm. team American and R.J. Davis, as a two guard. You yeah. have Elliot Cadeau takes mm -hmm. a second year, should take a leap. You bring in two freshmen and Ian Jackson mm -hmm. and Drake Powell, who I think can play the three. But mm -hmm. if you were to recruit them on a team that didn't have an All-American and a returning starting point guard, likely would play the two. Yeah. And then you and then you lose Harrison Ingram. And that's the one mm -hmm. I actually think will be more impactful than losing Baycott mm -hmm. because Ingram opened up an ability to play bully ball with mm -hmm. with skill. And he yeah. was able to rebound at a level that actually led the ACC in rebounds in mm -hmm. ACC play over his teammate Armando Baycott. Mm -hmm. And it enabled you to see, okay, Baycott is important for various reasons, but the the mismatch of this team is uh, Harris Ingram. So I think going for the guys like Van Allen Lubin, you go mm -hmm. for a Claude, they're not going to be Harris Ingram, but what mm -hmm. it enables you to do is realize that you're competent playing quickly when you yeah. have a player that can uh, get those rebounds, be tough and on the inside. Also, Washington has been kind of behind Baycott, behind Ingram. Mm -hmm. I think he's bound to be really good. Yeah. I saw flashes of him dominate games against good teams his freshman year when they were injured. Mm -hmm. And the Carolina team wasn't that great, but he was very good in his in his limited appearances. Uh, I think he's bound as a junior to have a really good year. And like you said, these guys aren't necessarily the guys that you want to uh, you want to get as um, replacements for mm -hmm. either Baycott or Ingram. But what you do have is a solid track record of success against high major competition, even if their schools weren't particularly good. Yeah, and I think that's the key. Is like if if Davis and Carolina are viewing these two guys as as more depth options. As it, like neither neither Alan Lubin or Claude are going to be viewed as as Baycott replacements. If if that's what the fan base is, if they're thinking like, well, these guys aren't as good as Baycott, what does that mean? Like that's not how they're being approached. That's not the role they're kind of expected to play. I, I think Claude's probably going to be a third or fourth big, uh, depending on on the development for Withers in particular. Washington, I think you're absolutely right. Washington and and Van Allen Lubin are probably the main guys in that front court. But I do think we'll see some three guard lineups, maybe even some some four guard or or kind of like only one big type lineups for for this team they got like you mentioned the two freshmen jackson and powell obviously davis and cadeau they add kate tyson who's a, a great a off ball kate tyson can yeah play. he's a he can play the four and be a spacer yeah that's what i think is like it, can you play him at the four because if so that could be some really intriguing lineups uh for for hubert davis to run out there of floor spacing and shooting and, and kind of speed and, and ability to get out and transition a little bit more so than they maybe have been able to do in the past so uh, while i don't think that to Jean Claude is like a huge difference maker. And I'm I'm not pumped about Van Allen Lubin necessarily, especially when compared to the the players that, that Carolina wanted, like Toppin and Hawkins. Uh, I think there's an opportunity here for, for Hubert Davis and the Tar Heels to do something a little different uh, and kind of come out of the Baycott area with a, a slightly different play style. And frankly, I think it could be really it could really work, especially with Cadeau's style and RJ Davis's style. I think there's a lot of intrigue in how this might play out for for this team in Chapel Hill. I'm extremely excited because as I thought about it, I was trying to think what's the best lineup combination. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think you can play all four of the guards we talked about, but I think three at a time is very yeah. likely to happen. I think it'll likely be Drake Powell playing as the starting three. Mm -hmm. I think Tyson starts at the four and Washington at the five. Mm -hmm. And then you have Withers who, despite a poor end of the season against mm -hmm. Alabama, was mm -hmm. very good at his role as the seventh man who played energy. And he kind of plays bully ball a la Harrison Ingram from mm -hmm. the small forward or power forward position. And you have guys like Jackson and Withers and Van Allen Lubin and Claude that are, mm -hmm. that comprise a top nine in your rotation. Yeah. Well, so basically you're eight and nine in that rotation were starters at high major programs and high, mm -hmm. high conferences. Like yeah. I, I really am optimistic about Carolina. The question will be how proficient can they be rebounding the basketball from mm -hmm. the four and five spots? Because they were great at that last year with vacuums in Harrison Ingram and Armando Baycott.
believe 100 college basketball coaches were polled in an anonymous survey about the best team in college basketball next season. Carolina got some votes. We're going to talk about whether these coaches got it right, who they picked first, all that good stuff coming up here in just a second. But first, folks, I want to tell you all about today's sponsor, Game Time. Going to MLB games in the summer is one of my favorite all-time things. The game, the food, everything that is part of the experience. I'm excited to make all new memories this summer. Still got about you know, six weeks or so until the end of the season, so we got some time to get out to the ballpark. And thankfully, I don't have to sweat high-priced last-minute tickets because Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. In fact, prices on the Game Time app, they actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. So with killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. Download the Game Time app now, folks. Create an account and use code Locked On College, and you will get twenty dollars off your first purchase. So again, create an account now. Redeem code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. All right, leave moving on here uh, from our conversation about Tijan Claude joining North Carolina as the kind of the second high profile transfer to join a new team, a blue blood team in this case, uh, in this month of August here. Want to move on to talk about the Candid Coaches series. And for many of you who are listening to the show, if you are a uh, diehard college basketball consumer, as many of you are in mid August, you're listening to the show, you've probably seen these articles come out the last couple of years. Uh, it's at CBS Sports, it's written by Matt Norlander and Gary Parrish, the two hosts of the Ion College Basketball Podcast. And what they do is they collect a, an anonymous survey of like 100 plus Division I coaches. And to be clear, this is a combination of high major head coaches, uh, low major head coaches, uh, low major assistant coaches, high major assistant, like they're not all head coaches, they're not all high major, it's a, a nice kind of mixture of a variety of different coaches. And they interview all these coaches, they ask them 10 different questions, and they release the results article by article uh, throughout, in this case, the last couple of weeks of August. It's a very fun series. I've always enjoyed reading it and kind of seeing what the pulse is uh, from these different coaches. And uh, they've, they've released two so far, which are the two we're gonna talk about today uh, to close out this show. The first question they asked these coaches was a simple one. Who will be the best team this season? That's it, no context, no, no additional explanation, just who is going to be the best team this season. Five teams received more than 7% of the vote. And Leaf, it didn't surprise me. I'm going to read the five teams, and I want to see if, if you think that it, there's any surprises uh, amongst these top five. Number one, the Kansas Jayhawks, Bill Self's rebuilt team, 35.6% of the vote. Number two is the Crimson Tide of Alabama, of course, went to last year's Final Four, 27.9% uh, retain a ton of their talent. Number three is also in the Big 12 with Kansas. That is the Houston Cougars, 13.5%. Duke comes in at number four at 9.6%. And then you're defending back-to-back -back national champion Yukon Huskies, fifth place, 7.7%. Leaf, out of that top five, Anything in particular kind of stand out to you or surprised you on how these coaches voted? Uh, Houston, actually. I know they've been a very consistently successful team mm -hmm. the past five years, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think they've been good for a while, but the past five years, they've consistently been a top 10, top 15 team. Yeah. Last two years, one seeds, but they lost Jamal Shedd. Mm -hmm. That was the engine for their team. Yeah. Uh, I, I read this article. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they said, well, though they lost Jamal Shedd, they have an embarrassment of riches, is what they mm -hmm. said. Yeah. Well, LJ Cryer's solid. Don't get me mm -hmm. wrong. Emmanuel mm -hmm. Sharp, solid. But you look at the teams that that also receive votes that were mm -hmm. picked six through 10, essentially. Mm -hmm. Those teams have far better backcourts. Yeah. And, and so that that's the one that shocked me. And I, I actually love Kelvin Sampson. Mm -hmm. Like, I have been a Kelvin Sampson guy for since I was quite young. <laughs> and uh, And those teams weren't necessarily good. But I was like, man, this team plays so hard. Yeah. Well, now they play really hard and they're good. They just lost the the heart and soul, first team mm -hmm. All-American, Big 12 player of the year, defensive player of the year, mm -hmm. and they didn't bring in an NBA prospect or anything. They yeah. largely stayed the same. So uh, I that's the team I have the most pause about. That said, I still think they're a top 10 team. I just don't think they're top five mm -hmm. uh, preseason poll type. They're a top 10 that develops because they're just that tough to beat. Um, yeah, I not like preseason expectation type. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with you. Like I 
13% of these coaches voting and saying they believe Houston is the best team in college basketball, not a top five team. They're voting that they think Houston is the best. I have a hard time like wrapping my head around thinking, having Houston ahead of Alabama and Kansas. I think Houston's, I, I, I have no problem if people say Houston's a top five team. I'm with you. I could see five to 10 range making some sense. But like, if you say Houston's third, Houston's fourth, Houston's fifth, like I get it. I think there's, there's a reasonable expectation that that could happen, but I have a hard time seeing them at number one because you're right. They, they lose Jamal Shedd. Yes. They keep LJ Cryer. Yes. They keep Emmanuel Sharp. I, I think there's a lot riding on the health uh, of Terrence Arsenault and how he kind of performs missing last year. If he bounces back and looks like an absolute dude, I think that's a huge, huge benefit for Houston. Maybe they do kind of crawl into that conversation, but you're you're just banking on that happening. And they add a transfer from Oklahoma and, and Miles Uzan, who who is good. Don't get me wrong. I think he's a good fit and I think he he's a really good Kelvin Sampson player. But like you said, he's not you know, he's not necessarily going to replace Shed or, or, you know, two years ago when they had Marcus Sasser, like they've had some great guard play. They've lost two of the best in program history in the last two off seasons. I'm still optimistic about Houston, but I was a little surprised to see that many coaches, you know, if we assume there's a hundred plus coaches interviewed, that means 15, 16 or so of them voted and said, I think Houston's the best team in the sport. And I'm just, I'm not quite there with them yet. So that, that kind of stood out to me as well. And you mentioned the other four teams, uh, the teams that are effectively six through 10, uh, that's Arizona, Baylor, Gonzaga, and North Carolina. I assume that since they were written in this order, that is the order in terms of how many votes that they got. Are there any teams kind of in that group that sort of stood out to you? Obviously we just spent a lot of time talking about the Tar Heels, uh, but any other teams there that you're kind of like, oh, like I think they should have more votes or less votes or, or, or kind of the situation with those teams. I mean, I, I think Gonzaga is going to be really good this year. Mm-hmm. Like I, I went on your podcast, Lock yeah. on Zags, and I I thought about it more and more, and I mm-hmm. really like their team. Yeah. If I were constructing my top five, and the funny thing is I'm so ingrained in thinking about basketball and like seed lines mm-hmm. that I was just kind of thinking like, oh, okay, they're, they're thinking one seed. I wasn't thinking of like that's the best team because then mm-hmm. I'm astonished that Houston was, was mm-hmm. number one. Uh, I would probably go Kansas, Alabama, Duke, mm-hmm. Gonzaga would be yeah. probably be my fourth. I actually made a ranking, so I'm pulling this up. So this is what I wrote before mm-hmm. I knew I was doing this podcast. Mm-hmm. Kansas, Bama, Duke, Gonzaga, mm-hmm. UNC, Iowa State, Baylor, mm-hmm. Houston, mm-hmm. Arizona. Okay. Or sorry, UConn, Arizona is my top ten. Gotcha. So I actually you have all these teams on there. <laughs> I think I think UConn's a little overrated this year. Mm-hmm. They're riding past success. And the funny thing is, and Andy can back this one up. Mm-hmm. Uh, the year when UConn won their first championship, they mm-hmm. were unranked. And I was like, this team is a top 10 team. Yeah. I tweeted this out. I did a poll. Said that the, the team I'm most high on compared to consensus was UConn. And I got lucky with a shot in the dark with San Diego State. Next year, I tried the same exercise. Went terrible. But the, the UConn one, I was absolutely certain on. This mm-hmm. year, you look at the rosters in comparison. And I know it's mm-hmm. a little long-winded, but I, I, I have the rosters in comparison right here. Mm-hmm. UConn had... Tristan Newton, who was an unknown commodity at that point, turned mm-hmm. out he was an All-American, uh, a really, really good player. They had Andre Jackson, Adama Sanogo. They turned out to have Donovan Klingon and other really good players. They had Jordan Hawkins as a sophomore. That's a mm-hmm. really good team right there. They had yeah. Samson Johnson, who played in place of Klingon at times, and Adama Sanogo. They had all these players. That's mm-hmm. great. Well, this year's team is not that. They yeah. have Hassan Diara, Aiden Mahaney, who I've mm-hmm. loved for a long time, WCC, my mm-hmm. neck of the woods, Andy's neck of the woods. Mm-hmm. We've known about Mahaney for a long time. He doesn't really resemble Big East guards. Yeah. It, it, it's his is very finessed, mm-hmm. uh, knows where to go, knows when to shoot, but slow mm-hmm. pace. UConn physical energy. Caravan, excellent player. Don't get me wrong. Not your leading score, which I think he figures to be. Hassan Diara, sixth man of the year. Mm-hmm. Energy, defense, not mm-hmm. necessarily the, the starting point guard for stability. Mm-hmm. Uh, you lose Donovan Klingon and Stefan mm-hmm. Castle, two picks in the top seven of the NBA draft. Mm-hmm. And Samson Johnson's now elevated from being a backup the last two years, who's been an energy guy to the mm-hmm. guy on the interior. And they've been having Adama Sanogo and, and Donovan Klingon manning those mm-hmm. spots. I think that their roster is not even close to the last two years. Yeah. And so to have them top five is, is a respect to Hurley because he, he does a great mm-hmm. job. Don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. But the roster is not close to anyone else in the top 10. See, that's I'm, I'm with you 100% on, on all of that. And I think that, that UConn, they're getting the benefit of the doubt. And, and I don't necessarily think that they shouldn't. Like, that, I get why they're getting the benefit of the doubt. And people are saying, well, we're going to have Hurley up here. We're going to have UConn up here because they've proven that they can develop it, develop guys. And the, the 
expectation that Hassan Diara takes a step and that Samson Johnson takes a step and that Solomon Ball takes a step. Like I'm certainly more willing to gamble that UConn is going to get more out of those players stepping into bigger roles than other programs. But my issue with UConn is for them to be a top five team and a number one seed and win the Big East. It feels to me like everything has to go right. And maybe it does. But in my mind, like Samson Johnson has to be ready for that role or Terrace Reed has to just absolutely pop off. One of those two things has to happen. Additionally, Caravan has to be able to lead the team. Uh, Liam McNeely has has to have a great freshman year. There's no indication he won't, but that has to happen. Mahaney has to adjust to being a Big East guard and playing at a different pace. And I mean, a, a, an adjusted role. He's not going to be. Uh, he's not going to have the same role he had at St. Mary's by at all. So he has to adjust to a new role and a new team and a new system. Hassan Diara has to take a leap. Like all those things have to happen. And again, maybe they do. Danny Hurley is as good of a coach in college basketball at getting all of those types of things to happen. But in my mind, even if one thing doesn't happen or like kind of one and a half things don't quite happen, this team's still good. They're still top 25. They're still a top four seed. But are they, you know, a three-peat? Are they a guaranteed one seed? No, I don't think that they are. And I I get why they got votes. I get why they're in this conversation. I'm not surprised to see UConn here the way that I'm a little bit more surprised to see Houston. Like, I'm, of course, coaches are going to vote for UConn, but I do see it, it. It looks to me like a lot more has to, like the planets have to align really well for this season to go as as UConn, of course, wants it to. And, and I'm just not as confident that it's going to happen that way for them. Well, yeah, and, and the crazy thing is, I would say that the last couple of years have been down years in college basketball. Mm -hmm. Like last year, UConn and Andy would, would agree with this. I, every mm -hmm. single poll we did, I had UConn and Purdue one and two mm -hmm. and I'm not tooting my own horn, but it was just that obvious that they were the best two teams yeah. in basketball. Yeah. Like it wasn't close. And you, you weren't alone and having those two teams at the top too. A lot of people did because yeah, yeah it, was, it was clear. It was clear. And then Houston was the third best team and their best player, mm -hmm. Jamal Shedd rolled mm -hmm. his ankle and that yeah. prevented them from making a final four. But I mm -hmm. feel pretty confident that they would have been the three in the final four. And then you take your shot with the fourth. Mm -hmm. Like that, it felt pretty good about that the entire yeah. season. Not, not just, Oh, it looked good entering March. No, like mm -hmm. the entire season, it was clear mm -hmm. this year. I think that you would have eight teams mm -hmm. from this that just like, looking at it right now that mm -hmm. are better than the third best team last year because Houston yeah. won a ton of games, but they didn't win by a lot. They won yeah. a lot of close games because it was their style. It's a la Virginia a couple of years mm -hmm. ago, but even that team had more dynamism to score. Kyle guy, Ty Jerome, uh, Deandre Hunter, like mm -hmm. that type of team had more dynamism to score than Houston did. So they gave themselves more risk. It still could have worked out, but as when shed got hurt, it was a two, it was a two point game. Mm -hmm. And so my point being is I think there's so much depth this year that if you were to compare UConn of this year coming up to last year's programs, that's probably a top five team, yeah. not this year. I think the teams are significantly better coming mm -hmm. into it. Like we haven't even talked about Duke and Cooper mm -hmm. flag. And I know that's going to come up in the next segment, yeah. but like Duke, Duke is, is a team that is as loaded as Duke has been since Zion Williamson's mm -hmm. team. Like, mm -hmm. and but we haven't even talked about them as a top three team right now. Yeah. Like that's how good of a year of college basketball we're getting. Alabama yeah, I mean, brought back a all American and and a team that's absolutely loaded. Then brought in Cliff Omarui, who we talked about mm -hmm. as U, uh, UNC missing. Mm -hmm. Brought back Jaron Stevenson, who was going to be a top twenty pick in my opinion, maybe even top ten. He's really talented, hiding in plain sight. USF takes they get Chris Youngblood. Youngblood mm -hmm. was the only reason USF was pertinent last year. Mm -hmm. Latrell Wrightsell stays, yeah. and then they keep Grant Nelson and Mark Sears. Like that's a team. That's yeah. a team and a half right there. Mm -hmm. And we haven't even talked about them. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, you mentioned Gonzaga Baylor's in that conversation too. Like this is as deep of a Gonzaga team as I can remember that Baylor team is great. And they're kind of just like floating around in that five to 10 range. It's going to be an insane season in college basketball. And Leaf, you mentioned, you kind of teased the teaser that we're going to talk about Cooper flag here in a bit. And, and that's what I want to talk about here is, is the third or the second survey that, that the Matt Norlander and Gary Parrish released here was about the best player next season. And if the coaches are right, who they projected to be the best player, well, it's going to be a diaper dandy. And we don't see that all that often. So we're going to talk more about that coming up in just a second. All right, Leaf, closing out the show, continuing our conversation about the Candid Coaches series uh, at CBS. Matt Norlander, Gary Parrish interviewed 100 plus 
college basketball coaches at the Division One level asked who the best team in college basketball is going to be this season. We talked about their responses there. And now they also asked who's going to be the best player next season. And I remember when they did this exercise last year, and it was almost not even worth writing an article about because it was Zach Eady. Everybody knew it was going to be Zach Eady. Sure, there was some other players in the mix. Uh, there were some other conversations to be had, but it was Zach Eady. And then the season came around, and guess what? It was Zach Eady because he is that singularly dominant. But now he's gone, and there's a lot less certainty who's going to kind of be that obvious back to the bat or, or obvious kind of number one player throughout the year. We've seen it traditionally be those kind of back to the basket centers when it was Oscar Shibwe and then Zach Eady. And this year we have a few of those guys on this list, but it feels like it's a little bit more guard centric. Uh, and of course it is led by Cooper flag. No mystery there. Flag received 36% of the vote uh, from these coaches. Next up was Mark Sears. who we talked about as well, 22%. Hunter Dickinson for that number one Kansas team is 16%. He's kind of your traditional big on this list. Uh, RJ Davis comes in fourth at 15%. And then there's two other players that they listed as receiving votes. That's Janai Broom at Auburn and Ryan Kalkbrenner from Creighton. Some more of those more traditional back to the basket centers. Uh, they indicated that six other players did receive one vote. I really wish they'd written out who those six players were because I am very curious uh, what other players might have received a vote uh, in this conversation. But Leaf, there's no Zach Eady, there's no obvious candidate, but were you surprised to see Cooper Flag get this percentage of the votes here from these coaches? No, I, I think he went to Team USA and was like a, a sparring partner mm -hmm. for the NBA's best. Mm -hmm. And so much so that he was good enough that many teams in the NBA changed their plans for the 2024 season in order to <laughs> be in the sweepstakes for him. So yeah. now you enter him into college basketball. I, I think he's easily the best player. What mm -hmm. does surprise me a little bit is that there was no mention of Dylan Harper or Ace Bailey, who yeah. are also touted so highly in the NBA conversation mm -hmm. that if these coaches were going to go the diaper dandy route, that mm -hmm. I'm, I'm surprised that there was less love there. Obviously, Dickinson's not a surprise whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did find it interesting that someone said, if you were to choose a player to start a college basketball team with, mm -hmm. you'd take Dickinson because he gets you 18 and 10. It's mm -hmm. an interesting theory. Yeah. But I, I just feel like he doesn't lead you to winning in the same way that some of these other guys did. Yeah. Like last year, if this was an exercise and you excluded mm -hmm. Edie, it would have been mm -hmm. super interesting. But I would have been probably in the minority. I probably mm -hmm. would have taken Jamal Shedd just because I believe so much of his intangibles and toughness. Mm -hmm. And and I wonder who's that, like who are those guys that are that are considered here as opposed to the numerical 18 mm -hmm. and 10. And, not, and this is not saying that Dickinson's not worthy of being in this conversation, mm -hmm. but it, it just felt like he had a bad year last year. Yeah. I think Dickinson to me feels like one of the safer, if you're projecting all Americans, which again, every coach probably handled getting this question asked them a little bit differently. Like if I was projecting who is most likely to be an all American next year, Dickinson, Sears and Davis feel like, I mean, I think flag is, is very likely going to be in that conversation, but uh, Dickinson, Dickinson, Sears and Davis are, are basically, I mean, unless they get hurt, you can write that in pen. Like those guys are going to be all American players next season, like almost no doubt. Uh, just because of the productivity that they're going to have, because of the experience, they're leading really good teams. Like they feel very safe to be in that conversation. I would agree with you if you were looking more at like, who would I pick to build a roster around? Like I really, I, I think Hunter Dickinson is great, but I'd be less willing to pick him over players who are more two-way skilled. Like Dickinson, you can put him on skates. We saw, I mean, that team was depleted last year when they were in the NCAA tournament, but Gonzaga just gashed their defense by just getting him out and, and, uh, in switches and putting him on skates. And it's like, you know, they they have better personnel this year. And I think they won't kind of succumb to those problems, but like you, you don't want to build a roster around a player who has a deficiency like that. And that argument could be used for Zach Eady in some cases as well, although he was just so, so dominant on the offensive end of the floor. But um, looking at this list, I think you're right. Like we said, there's six other guys who got votes. I wonder if Harper or Bailey were among those players. I wonder if VJ Edgecombe was among those players. Um, there's a couple other veteran guys that I think might have been in that list. Did somebody vote Caleb Love? Uh, the Caleb Love experience is a unique one, but I don't know if I would expect him to be the best player in college basketball next year. Uh, John L. Davis is a guy that stands out to me. Um, I think, I don't know that I'd vote him best, but if you're projecting potential All-Americans, 
I think he's going to have a, a lot of free reign at Arkansas. We've seen transfers, uh, g- veteran guards come into John Calipari's system and thrive like Antonio Reeves has done. I think John L. Davis is tailor-made to, to put up some big numbers for the Hogs. But uh, it's it's kind of interesting to see what these All-American teams might look like, who might end up being the first, the best player in the, in the, in the league. But it, in terms of building a roster around somebody, again, that's not how a lot of these coaches probably interpreted that question, but it's hard to, to deny Cooper Flag. He's so good on both ends of the floor. Uh, he's so dynamic and versatile. You could put him, you know, pencil him in and then build your roster a hundred different ways around him. Whereas somebody like Dickinson or even Sears and Davis, who are smaller guards, like you're a bit more limited in how you build your roster. Whereas Flag just has the ultimate amount of versatility. Yeah. And, and so here's the thing Cooper Flag can put up. 14 and eight. I mm-hmm. think he'll, I'll, I think he'll be north of that in terms of points, but mm-hmm. just bear with me for the sake of this, this argument, mm-hmm. he can put up 14 and six for all I care. Mm-hmm. And if Duke's really, really good, he'll be the mm-hmm. best player on their team. And yeah. that's not a slight at common Moloch. It's not con Knipple. Mm-hmm. You look at Tyrese Proctor, all these great players, mm-hmm. Cooper flag is going to be the guy that terrifies the opponent. Yeah. You could have a player in Dickinson score 18 and 10 and have a bad year last year. Mm-hmm. And that's the difference right there for me as someone who wants my basketball mm-hmm. team to be excellent. Mm-hmm. That's the way I would construct my roster. Mm-hmm. And but I think it's a fair point to take Dickinson, Sears, or Davis mm-hmm. over him because you have a proven uh, numerical output, and all those guys impact their team positively. Yeah. Uh, the guy that I think was an omission, especially if you're going to include the Janai Brooms of the mm-hmm. world, the the Kalkbrenner, whom I love, mm-hmm. I, I would consider Cam Jones for Marquette. Mm-hmm. That's a good someone one. Someone who's going to put up. I think he's going to put up north of twenty. I think he's going to mm-hmm. be the Big East Player of the Year. Uh, so I, I really like Cam Jones of Marquette. Mm-hmm. And then there's, of course, going to be people that that put up numbers on mm-hmm. inferior teams. But that, that's the only one I think was an omission. Yeah. Cam Jones is a great call. I, I didn't have him on my list, but I think him or John L. Davis or some of those other guys, uh, I'm, I'm very intrigued by what Kadari Richmond looks like in a St. John's uniform. I think that's a – I don't want to say dark horse. I mean, he was incredibly productive last year. But I wouldn't be surprised if he kind of sneaks his way into the All-American conversation as well. Just a, an incredibly versatile, talented uh, player that I think fits in, in Patino's system really well. So it's going to be a really fun year, and I'm excited, like, as we get into September and we get into, you know, still with the offseason to take a chance at – looking at some of the best backcourts in, in the country, some of the best uh, for, front courts, best roster construction, all that good stuff. And, and Leaf, I know that we're going to be able to have plenty of those conversations here in the coming weeks, but uh, that is going to wrap it up for us today here on the show. So I want to thank you, of course, for coming on the show, uh, giving your expertise, your insight here. Uh, Isaac and I will be back, folks, on Friday. Uh, more fun stuff coming your way. we got some big time uh, big time recruits making their announcements in the next couple days. So hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about some of those as well. Folks, thank you so much for listening until next time, as always, peace out.